For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is writer, editor, and educator Matthew Willem Solomon, here to unpack his book titled Blinded City, 10 Years in Inner City, Johannesburg. Your book recounts the history of inner city Johannesburg from 2010 to 2019 from the perspectives of the unlawful occupiers of space known as hijacked buildings. So tell us more, how did this book come about? So I started the book um, with a newspaper article for Mail and Guardian in late 2010 on a Doctors Without Borders survey, which found that 50 to 60,000 people in inner city Johannesburg um, were living in conditions below international standards for refugee camps, um, both South Africans and foreign nationals. And I visited one of these buildings at, at the time, a building in New Dornfontein, a so-called hijack building, although um, as I discuss in the book, I, I think the, the label hijack building can be misleading. It was in terrible condition. It had one tap for several hundred people. The, the conditions were very bad, no electricity, no waste collection. And, and I, I'm from Johannesburg, and this was... Uh, near my family home, five minutes away. So it was very shocking to me to see the kind of levels of dereliction uh, within the inner city. And so um, when I came back uh, for postdoctoral studies to Wits University, I decided to carry on the project and it evolved, um, particularly looking at unlawful occupations, the histories of these buildings, the um, stories of the residents, both South Africans, but also cross-border migrants, and really telling the story of the city from their perspectives, because many of the residents simply couldn't afford access to accommodation. So they were uh, informal workers, beggars, pensioners, sometimes students, um, the unemployed, and often these groups would be criminalized, targeted in raids or evicted, or in the case of foreign nationals, deported. And, and it seemed to me that this was a, really a story of the city that was really central to what was going on, but wasn't being told. And so the motivation for the book was to really try to tell that story. And briefly outline the legal struggles that took place concerning 7 Saratoga Avenue. So, yeah, 7 Saratoga Avenue was an old carpet factory. You see it. This is a photo montage based on the image I, I took on the front of the book by uh, the designer Joey Hi-Fi. Um, and I opened the book with the story of 7 Saratoga Avenue because the case that followed it called Blue Moonlight really established a lot of the struggles that would follow. And in particular, um, Blue Moonlight was the name of, of the company trying to evict the residents of 7 Saratoga Avenue. Eventually it went to the Constitutional Court and the court ruled that even if the evictor was a private developer, the executive municipality of Johannesburg was still obliged to provide what was called temporary emergency accommodation. So it was quite a major case building on previous cases, but it really reshaped the dynamics of housing in Johannesburg in the decade that would come. It, it slowed evictions, you know, it led to the development of a new plan to expand temporary emergency accommodation, but it also created new problems. For instance, um, where some of the residents from Severn Saratoga went, a shelter called Ikutaleni. There was another case because um, there were lockouts at the shelter, families were split. Um, I tell the story of Norm Sad and Ladlow, who was one of the residents of Severn Saratoga, whose granddaughter was taken away from her. And so the situation of temporary emergency accommodation created many new struggles and also a new constitutional court case um, called Ladlow, um, which the judgment was handed down in 2017, which established that even emergency accommodation, uh, you know, basic rights to dignity had to be respected. So there couldn't be lockouts. There couldn't be the splitting apart of families. But, you know, it, it still created the further problems is there still isn't adequate affordable accommodation. So many pe people have been in temporary emergency accommodation for a long time, sometimes more than 10 years. And tell us more about the living conditions of the blind community at Chambers. So, yeah, so I started with, uh, you know, um, I followed the story of a man called Jethro Gonese, along with other members of, of the blind community. And Gonese was actually a, um, you know, he, he was a special needs teacher in Zimbabwe, you know, has tertiary qualifications and, and so on. And, um, you know, he just couldn't survive anymore in Zimbabwe because support for special needs teachers was taken away. And, and so, you know, um, many blind Zimbabweans in Johannesburg, um, they don't get the disability grant, for instance. Some are, have qualifications, have worked in, in skilled jobs, but have very little um, support um, and so are forced 
onto the streets um, to beg. Um, you know, some I, I recall a story of another man called Edward Mavuro, who was a musician who had also recorded in Zimbabwe. So part of the story tells the story of, of these individuals and their kind of journeys through the city. And part of the title, The Blinded City, which alludes to these visually impaired groups, is that, you know, blindness is not just a disability. It's a form of vision. It's a form of understanding. They were also my guides through the cities, through these buildings and the, their histories. The title also refers to other types of partial sightedness and, and, and blindness, you know, the blindness, for instance, of white South Africans towards the past of, of middle classes and elites towards the continued violence against precarious populations. So, it, you know, the book explores these themes throughout. And briefly talk to us more to what led to the division amongst residents of Chambers, which resulted in the blind residents pursuing their own course of action to protect themselves. I think that's an interesting case because it shows, you know, we often have this idea, for instance, of South African and foreign national communities being divided and, and, and you know, and xenophobia, um, you know, but, but often it's not the case, you know, you have these communities living together. But I think what happened there is that the evicting company, you know, the, that there were blind residents in the building was part of the reason that a legal case could be waged, you know, because according to um, eviction laws, you have to protect vulnerable groups. And so the the evicting company offered um, a competition only to the blind residents and not to the other residents. Um, and this caused a lot of division within the community. And it was an attempt really just to push through eviction proceedings. And, you know, the blind community in the building, uh, you know, were concerned about these divisions, but they were also starting to get threats against them, suspicion against them, some kind of xenophobic threats. And there had been xenophobic violence in the building. So they made the decision to, to accept the accommodation, which created a lot of resentment. But I think the, um, you know, if, if if there's a story that comes out of the case, it's that often, uh, you know, that divisions emerge not necessarily just because of xenophobic sentiments, but, but because of contestations over space, over resources, over um, a sense, particularly in the, the, the South African community in, in the building, a sense of being abandoned by the state and of not having... Um, you know, the state providing them accommodation. But throughout the book, what I try to do is I don't, you know, although I, you know, I explore the ways in which both South African and foreign national communities live in the same space. And, um, you know, they explore particularly in 2015, where there was an outbreak of xenophobic violence. But I also think that we have to be careful not to assume just that inner city South African residents are xenophobic, because there are groups like as I discussed, groups like Inner City Federation who represent both South Africans and foreign nationals. There are many uh, intimate relationships, friendships, you know, partnerships that that cut across these lines. So I, I try to complexify in the book just this, you know, this crude image that, okay, there's just in the inner city, you know, South Africans against foreigners. It's, it's not the case. You know, the social life is much more complex. And South Africa often seems to be a country descending into illegality, whether it be about hijacked property rights or illegal mining activity. So do you think that the rule of law will ultimately be victorious in South Africa? Well, I think we need to be careful about what is criminal and what is unlawful. You know, someone can be an unlawful occupier without being a, a, um, a criminal, you know, because there's all of ways in which one can occupy a building unlawfully and as I show in the book that many of the buildings haven't been take that are called hijacked haven't been taken over by criminal gangs there are some sometimes there are formal buildings that have fallen into disrepair sometimes there are um you know slow occupations of old industrial spaces so the law does protect them and in fact some of the raids against the building have been declared unconstitutional for instance the raids under mashaba against so-called hijack buildings showed that and this is a constitutional court that they were done without evidence that they worked without proper justification and they declared that then you know the invasion of of um, individuals or families' homes without a, a warrant was unconstitutional. So we have to be very careful because part of the, the work of, of inner city groups is to say, no, we are unlawful occupiers. We are low-income residents without 
a place to stay, an affordable place to stay, but we aren't criminals and th that we need to separate unlawful occupiers from hijackers, which are people who are, you know, trying to steal buildings for, for personal gain, you know, and for to rent rooms or, you know, and, and so we have to make that distinction and that's a very important distinction. Um, and, uh, but yes, I think personally, you know, no one benefits from, you know, hijackers taking over buildings forcefully and charging illicit rental. Um, but I think that in order to deal with that issue, the city police and so on have to work with unlawful occupiers and also respect, you know, the rights and dignity of, of, of many residents in the city and not indiscriminately target. So the book, I think, is is also complex. You know, I, I did visit some of those communities and I think, you know, we had these um, these really, you know, the horrific sexual violence in, in July in Krugersdorp. And, and obviously that was very shocking to other people. It was a really appalling event. But I think that, you know, we also can't target, you know, think that everybody within those informal mining communities is responsible. There also are many women in those communities. And, and I think we need to really think about what are the structural reasons why something like you know informal trading gold emerges you know it's who is who is benefiting from it who's actually receiving the gold and who is trading the gold and that type of serious investigation needs needs to be done rather than only only targeting you know the the communities themselves saying that of course i think that there needs to be serious investigation into it there needs to be you know proper police protection for um, you know, women who are subject to to gender-based violence and sexual assault. But what I found, and I, I discuss this in the book, particularly unlawful occupiers and women involved had, have had very little police protection, very little protection against sexual violence. Often when they report cases, they aren't investigated, they aren't taken seriously. So I think that we really need to rethink the role of policing and think, well, you know, what is actually effective policing to protect, um, you know, women in, in living in precarious conditions. And I think housing also, you know, is a form of protection because if people have decent, secure housing, that's also protection against gender-based violence. So I think we need to look at these issues holistically and the structural reasons and not just think that, okay, we can solve everything just through, you know, militarized police action. And lastly, Matthew, what are you hoping people take away after reading your book? Well, I think precisely that. I think that I would like that, you know, to for people to take away that just because somebody might live unlawfully doesn't make them a criminal, you know, that they, we have grandmothers, families, you know, people who are just looking for a better life in the city and that those communities and the, you know, their leaders need to be engaged in public planning around the city that unless we, you know, the, the political leaders um, you know, NGOs, the state, all the stakeholders are really seriously engaging inner city residents um, in shaping the city, then we, we're not going to find meaningful solutions that, that we have to accept inner city residents, both South Africans and foreign nationals as, as uh, uh, you know, as communities that, that the city has to engage for a better city, a more secure city, a, a safer city. That was Matthew Willem Solomon speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about Blinded City, 10 years in inner city Johannesburg.